think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we are very pleased to have been hosting Callie Moore here for our Fossils Rock Lecture Series for the past few months. This is the last presentation, which we are sad about, um, but all of it has been recorded. If you missed some and you wanna go back and watch, it's all on MCAT's uh, YouTube channel. And if you want more of Callie, you can always watch PBS Eons, which is a very cool show on YouTube. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna get started. Thanks. Okay. Thanks everybody for being here. Has anybody been to all the lectures since January? Anybody in here? Yeah! Museum staff! Woo! Yeah, got a few of you. All right. Well, thank, thanks so much for coming to all the lectures. We are going to end with quite the bang. This is the 30th anniversary of Jurassic Park. So 30 years ago, actually 10 days ago today. So June 11th was the 30th, 30th anniversary. So we're going to talk about what Jurassic Park got right, what Jurassic Park got wrong, and then how close are we to our own Jurassic Park. So this is how the talk's gonna go tonight. I'm gonna start with the film, kinda get everybody on the same fit. I'm hoping everybody in the room has seen the original Jurassic Park. Okay, all right, got a lot of fans. I am obviously a big fan of the movie. Um, then we're gonna go into some facts, some things that Jurassic Park was actually kind of ahead of its time on, and some of the things that it got right. Then we're also gonna go through the fiction. So what it got wrong, which is a lot. We're gonna cover a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. And then we'll get into some dino DNA and how close are we to our own Jurassic Park. So the film. All right, so it was released on June 11, 1993. Like I just said, it was directed by Steven Spielberg. It's based on the 1990 novel by Michael Crichton, who here has read the book. Yes, true nerds, I love it, true nerds. If you haven't read the book, it is very, very, very good. Highly encourage you to check it out here from the library. The budget was only 63 million. If you think about like Avatar today and the billions of dollars they spend to make a movie, 63 million for Jurassic Park, but it made over a billion dollars. It was the first movie ever to make a billion dollars in the theaters, which is cool. And then it was added to the Library of Congress's National Film Registry in 2008. So that means it's part of our cultural heritage now. This movie is incredible. Now, it was kind of based a little bit. Uh, the inspiration for Dr. Alan Grant is kind of based on Jack Horner here. So we have Jack Horner out with the actor that played Lex in the Jurassic of Montana, which is so cool. So actually Jurassic Park has a lot of ties to Montana. I mean, the very uh, first opening scene after the raptor attack is at the snake water area in Montana, right? They're looking at the wrong type of dinosaur, but we'll get to that. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's said that uh, Jack Horner is kind of the inspiration for Alan Grant, and he was the technical advisor, so he allowed things to happen, and he also had some say in some things with the movie that, again, we'll get to in just a minute. Well, I think what's fun, if you're a keen eye fan like me, when you first meet Timmy, he says, hey, I got your book. I read your book. I read your book, and he holds up this. This is the book that they use in the movie. This is an actual book called Digging Dinosaurs by John, John Jack Horner. So they even duped his book for the movie, which is a lot of fun. Now what's even better, look down here. The foreword for the real book is David Attenborough. The foreword on the fake book is Richard Attenborough. Why is that amazing? That's who plays Hammond, right? So this is just fun. You can actually buy these, I think, on eBay or Etsy or something like that. They're notebooks. They're, they don't have anything written inside, but you can get the cover of it at least. But I always thought that this was great, um, that they even took a, a real thing and turned it into a movie prop. Okay, let's get into stuff that they got right, that they were a little bit ahead of the time. Six foot turkey. So throughout the movie, they're constantly comparing dinosaurs and birds, both with the dialogue and their behavior. So up here, when they're using the ground penetrating radar that actually doesn't work in real life, um, they're talking and Grant is like, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present day birds than with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backwards, just like a bird. Look at the vertebra, full of air sacs and hollows, just like a bird. Even the word raptor means bird of prey, right? So they're already bringing you into this idea that birds and dinosaurs are related. And in 1993, this is kind of new 
this was news. This was hot off the press kind of thing. Then also later in the movie, when these Gallimimus are coming in, Grant says, the wheel uniform changes just like a flock of birds evading a predator, right? So again, we're drawing these comparisons constantly between birds and dinosaurs throughout the movie, throughout all the movies, really. Clever girl. So dinosaurs are shown as dynamic animals. They're not slow and dumb. So when they first see the dinosaurs um, out in the distance, you know, um, Grant, they're moving in herds. They do move in herds. So that was a behavior. That's showing you. That's making you more connected to these creatures instead of just static bones somewhere in a museum. These are living, breathing animals that had their own behaviors, their own systems of living. Then probably one of the most famous lines of the whole movie, the clever girl scene. Uh, but earlier, Muldoon is talking to Dr. Grant when they first get to the raptor enclosure. And he's like, they show extreme intelligence, even problem-solving intelligence, especially the big one. We bred eight originally, but when she came in, she took over the pride and killed all but two of the others. That one, when she looks at you, you can see she's working things out. So again, we're showing that they're dynamic, they're intelligent creatures. And this was all big news, I think, in 1993. This snort is a very underrated moment in the movie. But they're depicted as warm-blooded. This was probably one of the biggest things in the whole movie, is that the dinosaurs were depicted as warm-blooded. And what's funny about this scene is the prop guy is a very famous prop guy. And originally, there was going to be a snake tongue, a fork tongue, that came out. And Jack Horner was like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. These are not cold-blooded animals. They're warm-blooded animals. We need something else. And so they came up with the snort. So a cold-blooded animal wouldn't make a breath fog on glass, right? Because they're the same temperature inside as outside. But we're warmer on the inside than an air-conditioned building on the coast of Costa Rica type of thing. But also, when they first see the dinosaurs, Ellie or Grant says, Ellie, we can tear up the rule book on cold-bloodedness. It doesn't apply. They're totally wrong. This is a warm-blooded creature. They're totally wrong. And then Ellie comes back. They were wrong. Case closed. This thing doesn't live in a swamp to support its body weight, for God's sakes. And so again, they're bringing you back to these dynamic creatures. They're warm-blooded. They move. They're active. They're intelligent. The other thing is that dinosaurs had a corrected posture. So. When I was a kid in the 80s, dinosaurs still every once in a while were portrayed standing straight up, like T-Rex was up right with its tail dragging behind him. And Brontosaurus or Brachiosaurus still had droopy tails and a droopy head. But this was probably the first time that a lot of people that had seen T-Rex reconstructed the way it should be. So standing straight out, um, they held their tails off the ground. Uh, their bodies were level. They had an S-shaped neck, so like a bird, right? So this is probably pretty groundbreaking for a lot of people to see a T-Rex positioned like that. The other thing with uh, actually Triceratops here and the meme-worthy gif that I have here, um, the skin of the sides of the back and sides of Triceratops are actually pretty close to the real thing. So this is an imprint of Triceratops skin. And you can kind of compare and contrast, and they did a pretty good job with the, the skin of the Triceratops there um, being lovingly hugged by Dr. Grant. I can't argue. I would do the same thing. So. They're al you're alive when they start to eat you. So there's some truth in this moment, and there's some false in this moment. So I'm going to talk about the false first. So in the movie, he comes up with this claw, and he's like, he slashes you here, here, and your bowels fall out. And the important thing is you're alive when they start to eat you, OK? We know now that dromaeosaurids, the group that has Velociraptor, Deinonychus, all the raptors, um, they leapt on their prey, and they used those claws to actually hold and pin down their prey. But modern birds of prey that use this technique eat their prey before it dies. So that part is correct. The whole disemboweling and slashing with these giant toe claws, eh, not so much. But they, you would still be alive when they ate you. The other thing that's really cool is they show T-Rex 
as an ambush predator, which is probably pretty spot on. So we think that it was an opportunistic predator. So it, it was not going to pass up a free meal. So if it sees a carcass, it's going to eat a carcass. But we think it could definitely hunt. And when it did, it was probably an ambush predator. So here is T-Rex bursting out of the forest into this herd of Gallimimus, or flock of Gallimimus, maybe. And all of a sudden, one makes a fatal flaw and trips. Dead. Um, so that might be a pretty good example of what T-Rex would have actually looked like hunting, being an ambush predator, bursting out of the trees, scaring a herd of dinosaurs, hoping that somebody makes a mistake. All right, that was very short for what they got right. Again, this is 93. 93, we've learned a lot about dinosaurs in 30 years. So let's talk about the fiction. First off, let's just talk about the dinosaurs in general. So these are all of the dinosaurs mentioned some way or another in the original 93 movie. So you can see I have the ages here, what we actually see on screen, living, breathing dinosaurs, what is in the embryo chamber when Nedry goes to steal stuff, and then what are on the brochures. So somebody actually zoomed in on the brochures that are laying on the ground in the mud during the, the chase attack scene and figured out everybody that's in there. Now what's fun is Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus Rex on the embryos. So the next time you watch this and Nedry's in there and he's picking out all the little embryo things, look real close, it happens fast. Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus are misspelled. <laughs> ah, that cracks me up every time. It's Stegosaurus, so this is an A instead of an O. And then they forgot the double N, so only one N in Tyrannosaurus. Uh, but it happens quick, but you can see it. Uh, two misspellings in there. But as you can see, this group of dinosaurs that they have, presumably, in Jurassic Park span a very long time. The oldest one is Herrerasaurus. Now, that's one of the first dinosaurs ever. And it's between 230, well, it's about 230 million years old from the late Triassic. And then the youngest dinosaurs are down here at about 68, 66 million. So the difference between the oldest and the youngest is uh, like over 160 million years between all of them. So very few of these dinosaurs would have lived at the same time in the same place. Now there are two exceptions to the Jurassic Park rule. That is Stegosaurus and Brachiosaurus are both found in the Morrison Formation. So we know they lived in the same place at the same time. Same thing with Triceratops and T-Rex. They are both found in the Hell Creek Formation. So we know, again, they lived at the same time, same place. But I guess the only one that makes sense for the name is if they only had Stegosaurus and Brachiosaurus for Jurassic Park because they lived at the same time. So just know that is that all, most of the dinosaurs that you see in Jurassic Park would have never lived at the same time in the same place. Now, excavation. <laughs> no, no dinosaur excavation is, is this easy. They don't come in the ground fully prepped. You're not picking nostrils uh, in, in, in the actual, you're not blowing sediment away. No, I'm sure every paleontologist would love for the excavations to be this smooth, but no, 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 no. Um, I think it lied to millions of children on how easy it is to get a dinosaur out of the ground uh, with this, because it is very hard and can take multiple, multiple years uh, to do it. Now let's get into the individual dinosaurs and look at some of the things that are wrong about the individual dinosaurs. So let's start with Brachiosaurus, because I think this is the first one we see fully. The full, first full dinosaur that we see on screen is Brachiosaurus. So could it actually rear up like this? Uh, maybe uh, the jury is still kind of out. I think most paleontologists say no. Some paleontologists say maybe. I don't think there's any hard yeses out there. Um, but if you watch this scene, take, take in how much elevation it gets by rearing up. At least in the movie, it looks like it gets an extra foot. I mean, that's a lot of work for a dinosaur to, that's this big. Again, this is probably 50 ton dinosaur rearing up on its back legs. That's a lot of work uh, to get a foot higher. Uh, the other thing is the, the family that Brachiosaurus belongs to has more of an erect neck and it has kind of a sloping back. So it's, its back legs are a little bit shorter than its front legs. So it's already kind of setting at a tilt like this. Um, versus being one of the dinosaurs like Momentosaurus, for example, it's kind of flat all the way out. They lay their head out flat. They don't come up with it. It's just out flat, their tail comes out, everything's flat. 
Brachiosaurus is a little bit different. So we, we eh. again, it doesn't seem, at least in the movie when they show this, it's getting a bunch of extra distance by rearing up. Um, the other thing is, could its tail actually bend like this to act as a tripod? We don't know. Uh, I doubt it, though. I doubt it. These were pretty rigid tails uh, that probably did not bend into a 90-degree angle to hold up the rest of the 70-ton dinosaur. So probably not. Probably not. The other thing is the feet are all wrong. I'm kind of obsessed with uh, sauropod feet because they're so weird. This is a hind foot. That, it, to me, this is a normal, average, everyday dinosaur foot, a little different. They've got a big, squishy um, thing, like cartilage, under their heel, just like an elephant does. It's got toes, it's got claws. Okay, yes, that's fine. This is the front foot. So they have these weird columnar-shaped feet, and they're in a semicircle. They only have one claw. They have extremely reduced toes. They're actually in the later titanosaurs. They don't have any toes. They just have this one random claw sticking off. Um, so go back. Um, you can see they've got like elephant front feet. And they should have these really weird looking feet. And we know just from the bones and from their tracks that this is what the foot looks like. The other thing is how it's chewing, or that it's chewing at all. So this is when it's a veggie-saurus, Lex, veggie-saurus. Um, sauropods and dinosaurs in general could only move their mouths up and down. There's none of this side-to-side -side action like we see in modern like ungulates, like cows, for example. The other thing is sauropods weren't chewing food at all. They had pencil-like teeth. They were basically just raking vegetation into their mouths and swallowing it whole. Most of them had gastrolis, so stomach stones. So that's where all of the processing occurred, was in the stomach. So those stones grinded up in the stomach. But right out of the gate, it's just, it's just raking leaves with these teeth and swallowing it whole. So this whole scene would not have happened. The other thing is that while it's absolutely adorable to think that they have these whale-like songs, uh, they probably hissed and used closed mouth vocalization. So they're not with like whale stuff. They're probably a lot more chill with their vocalization. I think Prehistoric Planet does a pretty good job at showing sauropod vocalization. So if you haven't watched that on Apple Plus, highly encourage it. Um, so yeah, so they were making low frequency noises a lot of the time and they were using some type of pouch in the trachea, probably, probably. Triceratops, my favorite dinosaur. These horns look fossilized. It was alive. It was living. They were bone covered in keratin sheaths. They would have looked like giant cow horns. So if you've ever seen a rough cow horn, yeah, sometimes there's some chipping in the keratin here and there. They're not cracked. Like, they're made out of stone. Um, so that's absolutely ridiculous. I don't know who let that go. Um, but yeah, they didn't look like that. And the other thing is that... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their coprolites were much smaller than this giant pile of stuff there. Um, so, so we have triceratops coprolites, and they're just like big cow patties, basically. They're, they're not as big as you think. The other thing is, I mean, that's taller than Malcolm, and Malcolm is probably like six, six foot, six one, six two. My husband's really good at uh, guessing actors' ages. Uh, uh, heights and um, that's approaching the cloaca of a triceratops. So if you're unfamiliar with the system of dinosaurs, they had a cloaca, like birds, one hole for everything. Uh, it's it's one-stop shop. And that is basically the height of, of it. So that, I don't know. I don't know if they're trying to say that, oh, triceratopses went back to the same place and pooped multiple times. Uh, in the same place to build up this pile, or if they're actually saying that, no, this is just one morning session of a triceratops, I'm not sure what they're saying, but it definitely wasn't that big to begin with. Ah, uh, yes, Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, we know that Tyrannosaurus rex had great eyesight, <laughs> and they had a most excellent sense of smell. Actually, their sense of smell was probably their most important sense that they have. Uh, and so this whole scene just annoys me because even in the movie, if T-Rex couldn't see if you weren't moving, which we know that's not true, 
they can smell still. So like, okay, you start over here, um, cold, warm, getting hotter, hot, 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 red hot, burning hot, take a bite. I mean, why not? Why, why not take a bite? I mean, you obviously can smell that like the scent is getting stronger and then you like blow off the, like why not just take a bite? Uh, so this scene is kind of fun, uh, but we know that all, all the people would have died very, very quickly if it was real. The other thing is this is a massive debate in paleontology right now is whether or not ha T. rex had lips. So uh, were their teeth out and exposed like Jurassic Park, or they, were they covered all the way down um, like they are shown in Prehistoric Planet? Uh, I think it was 2016, a paper came out that said, no, T-Rex didn't have lips. Then a paper came out earlier this year that said, yes, T-Rex had lips. And then I happened to be at a paleo meeting when that new paper came out and the guy that wrote the 2016 paper was there, changed his entire talk to rebuttal the T-Rex had lips argument. He laid down a pretty good argument about why they don't have lips, uh, but he did admit is the only way that we're gonna figure this out is if we find soft tissue preserved on the face and that will end the argument. Um, so everybody cross your fingers for uh, T-Rex soft tissue preservation. The other thing is m most uh, current research suggests that t adult T-Rexes topped out about 12 miles per hour. So if you were on a bike, you could probably outrun a T-Rex. Um, and actually on foot, you could outrun T-Rex too, as long as you were pretty quick. Uh, the fastest human in the world um, goes about 24, 25 miles per hour. So if you can um, sustain Usain Bolt speed, you could definitely outrun a T-Rex. Uh, but what's fun is that the preferred walking speed for a T-Rex uh, is about three miles per hour. That's us. That's how fast we walk. That's our normal, comfortable, I have somewhere to go, I'm walking with purpose speed. It's three miles per hour. So in the alternate universe where we live with T-Rex, you could literally take your T-Rex out for a walk and you'd both be real comfortable with the speed. <laughs> but if T-Rex went this fast, approaching 40 miles per hour, all of its joints would explode. So pretty sure it ain't going that fast. The other thing about T-Rex uh, is that it could open its mouth about 65 degrees, which I've never seen it mounted in full opening. I always see it uh, mounted about yay, or about here, about 28 to maybe 30, 40 degrees. Um, where they're actually mounted, but no, it went down much farther, which for whatever reason makes it seem uh, that much scarier. I don't know, being able to open its mouth that wide. Uh, but when you're attacking really, really big prey, I guess you probably need a really, really big bite to be able to even attack anything. Okay, so here we go. The other thing is it didn't make the weird dog, whale, bark, roar thing that they have in the movie. Um, it also probably used closed mouth vocalization and hissing. So a little less uh, scary maybe, I don't know. All right, Dilophosaurus, my favorite fictional dinosaur. It's actually a real dinosaur, but how they portray it is so fictional. Um, so for one thing, all the dinosaurs up until this point where we see Dilophosaurus are adults. The only babies that we see are in the hatching room, right? So you see a little velociraptor hatching and say, ooh, yay, little baby murder chicken, right? Um, but all the other dinosaurs are adults. This dinosaur is unusually small. And I've had some people argue, well, maybe it's a baby. Well, where are the other babies? And actually in the book, it explains where all the babies are. So read the book. Um, but anyways, uh, Dilophosaurus in real life is about 20 feet long and weighed over 1,000 pounds. Like it was the apex predator of its time. The middle, middle Jurassic, I think, uh, is when it was hanging out. Late Triassic, early Jurassic. Anyways, I forget. Um, but it, it should be much bigger. That's what I'm trying to say. Much, much bigger. The other thing is obviously the frill <laughs> and this venom spitting stuff. We have zero fossil evidence supporting this. Uh, but I guess since there's no evidence against it, it goes in the movie. So. But this one's a fun one. Oh, I forgot to mention back here with T-Rex uh, is that it moved quietly. <laughs> if you're a predator and things can hear you coming from a mile away because you shake the ground, you're going to be a very bad predator. Um, we've done some really cool biomechanics with the T-Rex feet, and they're basically shock absorbers. They would have moved silently. 
also quite terrifying that you couldn't feel them coming from a mile away. Oh boy, Velociraptor. I'm not even going to start the GIF yet because we've got a lot to go through. Um, first off, it's too big and it's the wrong genus. So we don't find Velociraptors in Montana. You know what we do find? Deinonychus. But Michael Crichton thought that Deinonychus was too hard for people to say, and it didn't have that same star power as Velociraptor. So he changed it to Velociraptor, but you don't find those in Montana. You find Deinonychus. But even if they had the right dinosaur, they're way too big still. These are about the size of Utah Raptor, which is the largest raptor that we know of. So there's a lot of things wrong with them. The other thing, they should have feathers. We know they have feathers. So what's fun, I guess I'll start it now because um, Whenever I watch this now, I'm just like, look at those naked dinosaurs. <laughs> they look like they've been plucked. In my mind, I have officially converted to feather dinosaurs. And so whenever I watch it, it always makes me laugh. They looked like plucked dinosaurs. We're not sure if they were pack hunters. We don't have really any evidence for pack hunting. Um, so we don't know if they were like hunting stuff together or if they were participating in feeding frenzies where one dead animal brings all the predators um, in. We're, we're not 100% sure about that. Um, their tails were rigid, incredibly rigid, uh, so they couldn't wag. If you notice a lot of times in the movie, these uh, velociraptors are wagging their tails. No, no, no. The other thing, I don't have it on here, but when they zoom into the face, I should have added another gif. One of them snarls, like lifts its lip up and snarls. No, 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 no. They did not have that minute control of their lips. And even if they had lips, I mean, the debate is still on whether they had lips or not. Um, so probably not snarling. The most important thing is they don't have bunny hands. They didn't do this. No, 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 no. They did this. Yes, exactly. They clap. They're clappers. They're not bunnies. They're clappers, which would also make the door opening scene a little bit harder. So they, you know, they use the door handle to like open it. So if you had hands like this, it would be a little bit more difficult to open the door. But yes, they have um, clapping hands. Also, yes, yeah, exactly, exactly, right? They were smart. They're probably the dromaeosaurids were probably the smartest dinosaurs out there. Um, if you uh, believe that brain size is uh, a reflection of intelligence, which sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, but probably the dromaeosaurid line was probably more of the intelligent, the bird line dinosaurs. Whether or not they could solve problems like crows, I mean, crows are basically as smart as like a three year old child. I don't Super smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super smart. So whether or not their forebearers millions of years ago were as smart as they were, if they've picked up a few tricks along the way, we're not sure. So there's a lot to break down with Velociraptor. This is a really great reconstruction of what Velociraptor would have been doing. So again, it's feathered. It's got its arms in. So again, this is bird line. So the reason why it's a clapper, it's a flapper, right? It's a flapper. So they're using their wings to create pressure to hold themselves and their prey down. They're using those massive toe claws to crunch into their prey again, to hold on to their prey. And you're alive when they start to eat you. The other fun thing, I think, is that we've looked at the chemical analysis of some preserved eggshell fragments, and it may indicate that Deinonychus laid blue-green eggs. And they might have had maybe a little darker speckling on them, and so the color was possibly used as camouflage, and there was probably around seven, although it was probably eight eggs, because most of these theropod dinosaurs had double ovipositors, so they laid two eggs at the same time probably like eight eggs in the nest. So really, this scene would look like that. And here is the reconstruction of the egg from the publication that looked at this. Now this is, there's some people that are saying like, heck yeah, this is super cool science. And then there's a lot of people that are like, nah, that is iffy science. Uh, so I like to roll with it because I like to think of blue-green eggs just period. Um, kind of like, what is it? There's a modern bird. Yeah, my, robins and cassowaries, I think, have the blue-green eggs like this, which are dinosaurs. Oh, my gosh. Okay, now, how close are we to Jurassic Park? Well, 
Let's think about how it works in the movie, okay? So on death. <laughs> So we start with a female mosquito and she has a dinosaur blood meal. She lands on a tree and she's covered in sap. The amber was excavated millions of years later by hairless apes and the dinosaur DNA was removed from the mosquito trapped in amber. This was mixed with frog DNA. Why they didn't use bird, I don't know. But anyways, frog DNA, or even alligator DNA. I mean, frog is really, anyways, I just have problems with that. Um, to fill the gaps in the dinosaur genetic code. Okay, so this is the layout for the movie. So let's start with that first one, the mosquito. So the mosquito that they actually use in the prop is a modern mosquito, it's an elephant mosquito. And it is the largest mosquito in the US. Now, there's a problem with this mosquito though. Even if it lived in the Cretaceous, it doesn't feed on blood. It actually eats other mosquitoes. So if you're ever in Florida and you see one of these things, don't kill it because you think it's going to suck all your blood out. Save it because it eats all the blood suckers, right? So this was the mosquito that they used in the prop amber, is an elephant mosquito. Okay, so well maybe they just use that as a prop. It's a lot easier to see that giant mosquito than a little bit mosquito, right? So maybe that was just for visual effects, okay? So the, let's talk about the amber. The amber was mined from the Dominican Republic. That tracks, there is amber in the Dominican Republic and two species of mosquito have been found in that amber. So, case closed, right? No. That amber in the Dominican Republic is only 40 million years old. Much too young to even get the youngest of dinosaurs that we feature in Jurassic Park. So, okay. Maybe not. Well, what about just like amber in general? Like did dinosaurs and mosquitoes even live at the same time? Did, would this whole scenario have happened? Maybe. So the last common ancestor of mosquitoes and other flies lived about 220 million years ago in the late Triassic. So we can do some really cool genetics and find the last common ancestor. So somewhere around the late Triassic, Mosquitoes branched off from the rest of the flies. If you were unfamiliar, mosquitoes are flies. Early mosquitoes split into two subfamilies about 197 million years ago in the early Jurassic. So okay, they're diversifying. We've got mosquitoes. Um, we know of three extinct genera from the late Cretaceous, and here they are. Here's two of them at least. So okay, we have mosquitoes in late Cretaceous amber. We have mosquitoes that lived in the late Triassic at least split off in the late Triassic. But around 40 million years ago, we have 25 species of extant genera. So by 40 million years ago, 25 species that you can find today are alive. So this is kind of the evolutionary history of mosquitoes here. So it does seem like there were mosquitoes living at the same time as dinosaurs. But did they feed on blood? That's a great question. Now, we do have a fossil, one, of a blood-engorged female mosquito. So you can see here, here's her proboscis, here's her leggies, and here's her extended abdomen filled with blood. And yes, we have shot lasers at her abdomen, and yes, it's really high in iron. So it is a blood meal. But it's only 46 million years old. So we know by at least 46 million female mosquitoes were taking blood meals. But how far does that behavior go back? We actually have no idea. We do not know when they started to take blood meals because we know not, not like there are some species of fly that will bite you and take your blood, but not all of them. So how did the mosquito evolve the proboscis? How did they get on this track of blood meals? We're not 100% sure. So while there were mosquitoes definitely early enough to get Herrerasaurus maybe, we're not 100% sure if those mosquitoes actually took blood meals. Poking a lot of holes in the plot here, sorry. <clears throat> so okay, all right, oh, that doesn't work. The amber mosquito thing doesn't work. So what about ancient DNA? Like how old is the oldest DNA that we have then? Where are we at on that? Well, that picture should give you a huge hint. It's 1.6 million years old from a steppe mammoth from Siberia. 1.6 million. Again, a very far cry from the 66 minimum that we need. Okay. 
And this is not a whole strain, by the way. This is just bits and pieces of genetic information that we can get out of a tooth that's 1.6 million. All right, what about de-extinction? De-extinction is a pretty hot topic right now. Mammoths, de-extinction. Dodos, de-extinction. Dinosaurs, you got to get a little creative here. And this is where Jack Horner and his Dino Chicken Project come in. They have the best logo ever created. So basically, what they're trying to do is create a chickenosaurus. So they're modifying the genes of a chicken embryo to turn on or off at certain times to create the characteristics that we associate with dinosaurs in a chicken. Now, we can only do this with the theropod lineage because all the other lineages of dinosaurs went extinct. So we can't make a triceratops from a chicken because they don't have that information. But we could make a just sort of dromaeosaur-ish by tweaking the genetic material. And from what I've heard, things are going well. Things are going well. So the three main things that you got to do to turn a chicken into a dinosaur. You need a long tail. Chickens have a pygus style. They have this weird little fused bone at the end where their tail feathers are. They don't have that long tail. So that's, first, that's one thing that you got to do, is you got to make a short tail into a long tail. It also has to be toothed and beakless, right? So like a velociraptor has like a mouth, a snout, and teeth, not a beak, okay? So we got to do that. That's another thing. And then the last thing, you need arms that have fingers. Birds have lost their fingers, right? They don't have fingers sticking out of their wings anymore. So these are some things that we need to tweak genetically to get these characteristics to show up. And from what I've seen, basically the last thing they had was the tail. So the tricky part with this, and the reason it's called reverse engineering, is you're basically reversing the evolution of that species. You're taking it back to earlier forms. You're tapping in to the history of the genome that we all have. The pygus style was the hardest one because they couldn't figure out how it evolved. First, you have to understand how something evolves before you can rewind it. So sometimes that's the hardest part of this whole thing. But they have, from what I've heard, mostly figured it out. The pygus style is fused and so is the sacrum. And it has to do with inflammation. It's really cool. I can't wait for this paper to come out. But anyways, so this is the dino chicken project. None of these animals have been hatched. <laughs> just know that. Um, we just look at them under a microscope and then that's animal experimentation for you. Uh, but we're learning a lot, especially learning a ton and getting a ton of um, evidence to support evolution. So if dinosaurs and birds were not related, you wouldn't be able to make a dino chicken. If birds did not evolve from theropod dinosaurs, this would not be possible. So we're not hatching them yet. You can't call up your local breeder and get a silky velociraptor or something like that. So we're still quite a ways away from that. So Jurassic Park's probably not going to happen. Prehistoric or um, Pleistocene Park could very well happen in my lifetime. Um, regardless of the ethics surrounding it, I am not on board with bringing a mammoth back. Um, but that could definitely happen a lot faster than bringing a dinosaur. So we don't have to worry about running away from T-Rexes anytime soon. And thank you so much. Some of my short lectures, some of you guys have really had to deal with them. The list of all the dinosaurs. Yes. Yep. Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, what I noticed was that uh, the older the dinosaur was, the larger they were, and the younger they were, it seemed like they were um, downsizing. Is that mm, no, not no. I think it's just kind of a bias with the dinosaurs that they chose. Um, because T-Rex is still really, really big. I mean, it's not as big as Brachiosaurus, but even towards the late Cretaceous, middle to late Cretaceous, we still had sauropods around. So they were still really big dinosaurs. Um, Triceratops is way bigger than Gallimimus or Velociraptor or yeah, 
about the same size as Parasaurolophus. Uh, Baryonyx is a little bit bigger. Brachiosaurus is definitely the largest on this list, and it's kind of in the middle, but that's because it's a sauropod. If we had a couple of other sauropods on there, it would be a little bit more spaced out. But no, dinosaurs were in their heyday 66 million years ago before the space rock knocked them out. So. Now, very many people made the connection between the pores that um, you can see and shell bits of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. like a what was it? Like oviraptors, uh, truodontids, um, myasaura, um, so egg mountain, basically. Egg mountain. Yeah. Egg mountain. Notice was that the pores are just like a chicken egg. They're very similar, but we've done a little bit more work and it shows that there's more pores. Um, so, let me fast forward a very long way. Ah, okay. So a lot of these theropods had these kind of oval-shaped eggs, but one end was bigger. And we have found that the bigger egg has more pores than the smaller side. So we think that that, that narrow end was in the ground, and the round part was above ground. So you had more pores in the above ground space where you're actually getting air than lower. I can't think of a, I mean, there's a lot of nests ground nesting birds out there but i can't think of one that actually like pushes its eggs into the sediment that i can think of yeah so while it is similar yes they have pores they acted just like a bird egg they were a little bit different mainly because of the way at least with the um the theropods now sauropods lay like big round eggs and they're just like they're just out there they're just good luck kids that's what we think yeah I'm just going to ask, so with the raptors being pretty inaccurate representations, uh, how likely would it be that, I mean, velociraptor kind of too small to really prey on a human, but how likely is it that raptor and species would actually prey on a person, or would they see that as prey Oh, I would assume by Utah raptor size, we would be on the menu, for sure. And then once they figure... <laughs> Once they figured out that we are absolutely helpless, we would definitely be on the menu. Yeah. And then, regarding that, with the, in the QHTC, what did the QX be going after them? Because it seems like a very small reward for a, for a, a lot of injury. For um, a lot of injury and just the end. Right, right. That's a good question. Um, it might come down to just like how that T-Rex was feeling. Is it grumpy? Is it annoyed with this thing that's moving fast with lights on it? Want to make it stop? So I'm going to attack it and chase after it? I mean, like, why do dogs chase after cars? I mean, 99% of them get hit and die. So, um, it. Pr I mean, obviously, it's just the movie and it makes that scene really, really cool. Um, but I could only imagine if we could pluck a T-Rex and bring it to the 21st century, or the 20th century in this case, um, a car would be pretty incredible. Would it be scared of it? Would it be like, uh-uh, no way? Or would it act like this T-Rex and be like, I want to kill it, eat it, die? Um, it's a great question. I don't know. I don't know if it would have the risk-reward um, like debate in its head. Like, is it worth it? It does give up fairly quickly, though. So. Also, um, in Jurassic World, uh, the T-Rex is chasing Claire. Right. Um, also, the high jumps would break. Yeah, she would die anyways, yes. Lots of people die. Right, and it's chasing. Well, so, in the Jurassic World universe, again, T-Rex has been spliced with frog and so it still can't see unless you're moving so it's chasing after claire because she's moving and it's not catching her either so they slowed t-rex way down to a much more believable speed i think at that point if you were if you were running at top speed as just like an average human i think you'd have a good chance just don't fall and don't wear heels definitely yeah other questions yeah so like, I had some things about like, a, like even the atmosphere being different at those times with sure. like, yeah. like oxygen levels and things like that. So wouldn't that also affect on how big an animal could? Right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So the Cretaceous was a much different world. We were definitely living in a greenhouse world. It was much hotter today. There was about twice as much atmospheric carbon dioxide as there is now. So it was much, much warmer. But actually, we had about the same oxygen level, except in the oceans, because warmer oceans hold less dissolved oxygen. And also, there's this whole silicate weathering process that tries to draw down, so it acidifies the oceans. It's a big trade-off. I just filmed an Eons episode about it today. <laughs> So look out for that in the late summer, um, actually early fall. But anyways, um, so yes, oxygen can affect how big some things can get. But at least in the case of dinosaurs, it comes down to egg laying. So mammals were really limited on how big offspring we can actually carry <laughs> and then have birth to. And so when you're not limited by an egg, that's pretty nice. You can have a whole bunch of babies and they can be any size and then they grow really, really fast. Dinosaurs grew incredibly fast. So we know that Cretaceous was in this time of extreme production. All of the systems were firing on full cylinders at this time for sure. But the oxygen, actually, the oxygen might have been a little bit lower than what we have now. Um, instead of higher, which I think a lot of people would think of, it's not like carboniferous high at like 30% or something. Um, but I think it might have been slightly lower than today. And the dinosaurs seemed like they did just fine. I mean, they were um, ruled the planet for almost 200 million years. So they were doing something right. But yeah, the girl, I, we also have an Eons episode about the growth of dinosaurs too. It's an old one. You're going to have to go way, way back in the catalog. Yeah. Okay pass out from lack of oxygen? Maybe. If they evolved in a world with lower oxygen, their evolved, their bodies, their system can deal with it. We are actually pretty good until we get down to about 13%, and then that's when we start getting a little woozy and we have some issues, um, altitude sickness and things like that. Um, so, but humans actually have a pretty wide range of oxygen that we can handle. So we think dinosaurs probably had that too. But again, these animals would have been evolving for millions of years in these different levels of oxygen. So dinosaurs were perfectly evolved for their ecosystem until the space rock. And then everything was completely gone. Yeah. Callie, tell us about your supposition about the flexibility of eggs that are dropped to the ground from a dinosaur that the uh, all depositor is 15 feet off. Right. OK. Hey, so I have another small obsession with sauropods. This is not the best scene to think about, but all right, sauropods are really tall. Um, Brachiosaurus's head was about 45 feet off the ground. They were about 75 feet long. I can't remember how high their hips went off the ground, but a lot, a lot. They're very big, but they laid eggs. So my question is, how does one lay an egg when your cloaca is a story off the ground or more. Probably closer to two stories off the ground for the really big ones. So there's a couple of things. Maybe they squatted down really far. This would be um, a really easy test for biomechanicists and people that are really good at computers. They could definitely put in some limits on these joints and ligaments to see how far a sauropod could actually squat. Um, and then that would give you kind of a baseline. And then from there, did they just drop them? Or did they have an ovipositor? So kind of like a sea turtle. So something that actually came out of the cloaca and got it closer to the ground. And if so, how long would that have to be? I've spent way too much time thinking about this. Um, there is, we do have a little bit of evidence that sauropod eggs, when they were freshly laid, the shells were thicker. And the shells slowly thinned as the little baby sauropod got closer and closer to hatching. So maybe there's a little thing. Sauropods were looking for very soft sediments. So they dug their nest using their back foot. So they'd use this back foot and do one of these motions here. So they had these kind of cashew shaped nests. So they would dig it out there and then they would lay their eggs. They're obviously not laying on their eggs. They're not brooding. So what do you do? How, how do you keep your babies warm? We don't know. Prehistoric planet has a great hypothesis that they um, nested in areas of um, volcanic activity, so the ground is just naturally heated. 
Um, so like around a hot spring, you'll notice that the ground around the hot spring is actually warmer. So maybe they seeked out these areas that had natural hydrothermal heat and laid their eggs like that. And then I was like, peace out. Or maybe they stayed around. We're not actually sure about the parenting plan of a sauropod. Um, but at least, yeah, the, the egg laying part of it is um, very questionable. I think this would be a really great master's degree, I think. If anybody wants to take this up, I ain't got time for this, but if any of you guys want to study how sauropods laid eggs, like I've got it all laid out for you. You can get different sand and water compositions to get different thicknesses. And you can make your own little egg out of something and drop it from different heights and see what happens. Like it would be fun. And there you go. There's your master's degree all laid out for you. Nice and pretty. <laughs> yeah, over here. Right, right, thanks, thanks. But I wondered if there's any response back to the criticism that you might or others might have like this uh, to the paleontologist who was the film advisor of Jack Horner. I think Jack Horner did a great job. I mean, picking out that lizard tongue flick and putting in the snort was genius. Um, he did get overruled several times, like in Dilophosaurus case he was like we don't have any evidence for that and Spielberg was like well there's no evidence for it and there's no evidence against it in the movie so I think Jack Horner did a pretty good job um, and he was doing a lot of cool paleontology back in the early 90s um, late 90s yeah he did not get a PhD he did the field work yep he was yeah yeah he tried He's got, um, he's got um, dyslexia, and so that held him back. And when he was in college, dyslexia like wasn't a thing yet. So people just thought he was lazy and not a good student. Uh, but he tried many, 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 many times to get his degree. He's got a couple of honorary degrees now, but it didn't matter. He was good enough. He um, went to Princeton and worked at Princeton for a while, um, got their dino lab going. And then when the Museum of the Rockies was being built, there was like a big hoopla, like we need a, we need a famous paleontologist to kind of run this ship, you know? He did not go for the fame and PhD. He did the field. Well, I think that there's more fame in field work than a uh, PhD. <laughs> Finding a dinosaur is way cooler than writing about the dinosaur, let me tell you, as somebody that has written papers before. Yeah? Who is funding chasing the stars? George Lucas. George Lucas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's who's funny. And they get a lot of actual NSF grants and things like that. Like, they're doing really cool evolutionary Evo Devo stuff. Um, so I think they've actually gotten some big NSF grants, too. Uh, but I think the, the seed funding was Lucasfilms. Yeah, in the back. They do have a, they do have a, it's like dinochickenproject.com, I believe, and you can look into it. Um, it's not very user friendly. Like I had to, to get their logo. I had to get, I took a picture of a logo during a talk. That's the logo that I had to use. So I couldn't find a good logo on their website, but is it okay? Is it okay website? I mean, they're definitely putting more money into the research than the uh, outreach part of it, but that's okay. That's okay. Where are they doing that work? Oh, awesome. well, a lot of it. <laughs> How come T-Rex has such small hands? <laughs> oh gosh, that's a great question and um, we don't really know. Um, so when, a couple things. When you look at older Tyrannosaurids, so T-Rex is one member, the last member of a very long line of dinosaurs in the family Tyrannosauridae. And when you look at Older, earlier Tyrannosaurids, they do have a little bit longer arms. They have three claws, they have more. And then the closer and closer you get to T-Rex, they get smaller, they lose a finger. Yeah, they're just down actually these two, one and two. Um, and when you look at juvenile T-Rexes, their arms are slightly longer compared to their body size. And it's like they just stop growing and then their bodies get bigger and then they're left with like teenage arms on the size of giant dinosaurs. So, there's been a lot of theories thrown out about why they had such small arms. 
Um, but most recently, a paper came out and refuted all the earlier ideas. And they think that it has to do with how T-Rex ate. So basically, the big kicker in this question is what is the evolutionary pressure driving smaller arms? I mean, there has to be a reason that the arms are getting smaller, right? Well, some of the earlier ideas was for <laughs> maybe, um, maybe they use these tiny little arms were the perfect length to uh, clasp on during mating. But if it's super important for you to hold on to your mate during the deed, why would getting smaller and smaller arms instead of longer and stronger arms to hold on? Oh, you know. The other thing is um, somebody said it was to hold their prey close to their, their face. Well, T-Rex's arms were actually so short that they couldn't touch their face. So if they were holding on to prey, they like would have a really hard time eating it because it was too close to their mouths. And like they have a five and a five foot long skull and their arms are only three feet long. So there's no way a T-Rex can hold anything away far enough to actually take a bite of. So that's a problem. Also, if holding on to your prey um, was super important, why evolve smaller, weaker arms instead of stronger, longer arms to hold on to your prey? So this new paper came out and it was like, T-Rex uh, participated in feeding frenzies. So let's just say one of those big sauropods died. And just like a whale washing up on a beach in the Arctic, it's bringing in all the polar bear. Oh man, polar bear can smell that carcass from everywhere. Day one, you got like one polar bear. Day two, you got like three polar bears. After a week, you got like 15 to 20 polar bears, right? They're all eating on the same carcass. Now, if you're T-Rex, you're having to eat a ton of food all the time to keep that energy level up. You're a high maintenance individual. You've got high octane in you, right? And so if you're in a feeding frenzy, it's basically keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all time or they're going to get bit off. And who wants to get a limb bit off? I mean, even for T-Rex, that would hurt. They have nerves and blood vessels all over their body. T-Rex isn't brushing its teeth and flossing twice a day. So it's probably a pretty nasty mouth if you're eating like 100 pounds of food every day, meat every day. So you got like rotting stuff in your mouth. Maybe they had some kind of symbiotic relationship with smaller animals that would come in and actually pick their teeth clean. We don't know. Who knows? Possibly. Um, but again, if you got bit by a T-Rex, there's a very good chance you could die of infection. Like there's a lot of evolutionary pressure to not get limbs bit off. So that's what this paper is saying, is that because of the way T-Rex ate, they really didn't need their arms. They were just getting in the way. They were selectively pressured to get smaller. Now, I've heard through the grapevine, that there's a whole other paper coming out that's going to refute that idea and introduce another one. It should be out later on this year. So we'll see what they have to say, but really we have no idea. But remember, they were huggers. They were clappers. What was that? Oh, the largest bite, so um, what was the bite strength of T-Rex? I can't tell you numbers, but I can tell you it was the strongest bite force on land that has ever evolved. So they could crunch bone, just like, like, triceratops femurs are about this big around at the thinnest part. And T-Rex could just like chomp, chomp right through it like it was butter. Once they were an adult, once they were an adult, they could eat bone, they were durophages. Is a Komodo dragon a warm-blooded pick up? A no, they're a lizard. That's the biggest lizard that's still alive today is the Komodo dragon. But there's a lot to be said about how Komodo dragons eat and hunt that we could might take away. So they um, have feeding frenzies. If you've ever watched a Komodo dragon feeding frenzy, wow, that'll change. That it's going to change you deep inside. Um, and it's pretty incredible because the way that they hunt, oh, it's so, it's, it's a jerk move, undoubtedly. So Komodos have really nasty mouths too. And basically they just go up to a water buffalo and just nip them on the ankle. Just a little nip, a little nip on the ankle. And then they follow it around like the Grim Reaper until it finally dies and succumbs to infection. And the whole time that wound is festering, more Komodo dragons are joining the Reaper Congo line, following <laughs> this poor water buffalo around until it finally dies. T-Rex were probably not that sinister, but you could definitely get an infection from a T-Rex. Yeah. 
So kind of going off that a little bit, I know for a while people thought Komodo dragons possibly in the venom, and it was found it was more just like sepsis and such that they caused. But with, I think there's like three or four dinosaurs in Jurassic Park that are poisonous or are more accurately venomous. How likely is it that there were dinosaurs with actual venom? So luckily with venom, there you got to have a place to hold it. So luckily with most modern venomous animals, we can actually see in their lower jaw a venom pocket where that venom would go. And at least so far with dinosaurs, we've never found a venom pocket. So we're pretty sure that they didn't at least have something that was coming out of their mouth and injecting into something. Now the case of the spitting Dilophosaurus, that would be a little bit harder to track. Uh, but who knows? I mean, we know, we know so much and yet next to nothing about dinosaurs. So I sometimes I like to take the Steven Spielberg route is like, well, there's no evidence against it. So why not? Why not? Yeah. On, on that note, like, uh, would it be easier to like, look at like the tooth record on that? Because like, like a lot of the, or, or is it because like, it fills in, you wouldn't be able to tell you. Well, I think if, if, if dinosaurs had teeth like fangs of a snake, that actually had a tube that went through it, oh yeah, we would definitely find that. Um, teeth fossilize immaculately. Um, so it would just take somebody to slice and dice one of those tooths and look for it. At least right now, it doesn't seem like any of the T-Rexes had venom. We don't see the venom pocket. We, do, we don't see a little hole at the top of the tooth or anything like that. So it's probably pretty unlikely. Also, if you're the largest predator that has ever evolved, why do you need all these bells and whistles when you have the largest bite force of all time? Uh, it seems a little overkill, but I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah. yeah. One thing I thought you were going to say was that T. Rex in the movie doesn't have feathers, and so, but. So, T. Rexes and feathers. <laughs> all right. So, there's a couple of things. Most of the, when we look at the dinosaur family tree, there's the Ornithischians and the Saurischian dinosaurs. And it seems like feathers, at least body covering, goes back before the split of those two groups. So we have found pterosaurs, really, really old pterosaurs, that have body covering on them. They have like little filaments, not necessarily feathers, but not fur either, but they've got body covering. So we know that body covering goes down much lower than that split. So all dinosaurs have the potential to have some type of body covering. We have seen some weird little quills and things like that coming off of some of the um, ceratopsian family, like the little protoceratopsians. Um, oh, I'm blanking on the names. Dyracosaurus. Dyracos Dyracosaurus. No, not that one. Um, anyways, we've got some really great fossils of them. So also, if we've, we've got them on the totally separate lineage than where we find birds, okay, man, we got covering all over the place. Now let's think about T-Rex in general. We have some skin impressions from adult T-Rexes, and they don't show feathers. We do have skin impressions of other large theropods, like Despletosaurus, which is an older Tyrannosaurid. No feather evidence. But if we pop across the pond and go over to China, there is a fairly large Tyrannosaurid, U. Tyrannus, that is covered in feathers. It's smaller. It's an older ancestor of modern T, or not modern T Rexes, of later T Rexes. And it's covered in feathers. All of the family members that surround the Tyrannosaurid family have feather evidence. So I think a lot of people now are thinking that possibly as a baby, a little T-Rex hatchling would be completely covered in feathers. And as it got bigger, it lost its feathers. Now an adult T-Rex might have kept feathers around in the display area. So maybe on the back of the neck, on the front of the throat, maybe on the front of the chest, on the tip of the tail. Places that you think of birds moving and shaking, right? They might have kept them there. But as a dinosaur that's as big as T-Rex, 15 feet tall at the hip, 45 feet long, seven ton animal, at that size as a warm blooded animal, your number one goal is actually staying cool and not being kept warm. So elephants have those giant ears to help them cool off. Like they get hot easy. 
So if you were that big as an adult T-Rex and fully covered with feathers, you might overheat. That might not be good for you. So that's right now we're kind of in this weird gray zone with T-Rex. But if you look at a lot of juvenile T-Rexes, they're usually feathered or when they get to the teenage age, they're like molting and they look, they look bad, you know, because they're like half off feathers, half on feathers, you know, it's just, they look a little rough in that point, a little mangy. And then by the time they're adults, they either just have display areas, but they're not fully covered. So that's about where we are with T-Rex and feathers right now. But once we find more skin impressions, which we will, it's becoming a lot more common than we used to think it was. We used to just blast everything out of the ground and get the bones out as quick as possible to put them on display. And now we slow down. <laughs> we slow down a lot and, and look for things like skin impressions. So I think there'll be more and we'll get some more information about T-Rex in the future. Man, you guys came prepared today. I think this is more questions than I've had the whole time. All right, well, if there's no more questions, thank you all for coming.